I am so glad you're here because today we're going to be learning about mechanisms and arrow pushing in organic chemistry. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the patterns that you can identify and also how to draw curved arrows to indicate the flow of electrons. And make sure you stick around to the end because I have some practice problems that should help for your next exam. The first pattern for mechanisms is going to be nucleophilic attack. This mechanistic pattern relies on your understanding of nucleophiles and electrophiles. I have a video here which you can go back and review in case you need some more practice. In nucleophilic attack, a nucleophile which is attracted to a nucleus or positive charges is going to attack electrophiles with either electrons or bonds or negative buildup of charge where we can find electrons. And these electrostatic attractions between negative charged particles and positively charged particles is what drives this reaction. Remember, when drawing curved arrows, we always start with the tail of the arrow beginning where the electrons are coming from. And the head of the arrow is always going to go to where those electrons are being pushed or being moved to or being transferred to. Another example of this might be an alcohol which has an oxygen with two lone pairs on it, attacking a carbonyl group. So for example, if you had an acid chloride, what would happen here is because the oxygen is partially negative and the carbon in this position is gonna be partially positive due to the polarity differences and the electronegativity between carbon and oxygen, this is going to build up a partially positive charge at this carbon position. And therefore, the electrons from the alcohol can come in and attack at that carbon position, which is going to push these arrows up. This is another example of a nucleophilic attack, where the nucleophile is going to attack with the electrons, the electrophile. The second pattern for electron pushing mechanisms is going to be the loss of a leaving group. In these examples, a leaving group, which is perfectly stable by itself, is able to come off, and this involves just a single arrow. This arrow is indicating that the electrons that previously were contained inside of this covalent bond are now moving to exclusively being contained on that leaving group. So for that reason, the bromide, as it leaves, now contains eight electrons and is going to be negatively charged. Remember that bromine is a halogen, which should contain seven valence electrons in its neutral state, and therefore if it has eight, it has an extra electron giving it a negative charge. And what that does is that leaves behind a vacancy on the rest of this alkyl group, which are these carbon-hydrogen bonds, and this leaves behind what we call a carbocation. So we have lost electrons from the alkyl group, and they have been gained at exclusively the leaving group. And again, this flow of electrons is indicating beginning at the tail where the electrons are contained in this covalent bond, and they are moving to where the head of the tail points at the bromine. Now, while this pattern only used one arrow to indicate a leaving group, it is also common to see multiple arrows that lead to eventually the loss of a leaving group. Consider Consider this example where you have electrons on oxygen which can move down to form a new double bond between nitrogen and oxygen, and the flow of electrons is going to cause these pi electrons between carbon and nitrogen to move down to this position, which is going to result in a cascade of electrons moving from this pi bond into this carbon to carbon bond, and then subsequently what that's going to do is cause this to kick off the chlorine leaving group, leaving behind a chloride atom, or ion. And therefore, the product of this reaction is now going to look a little bit different, where now we have a carbon to nitrogen single bond, at this position, we now have a nitrogen to oxygen double bond. And remember, the cascade of electrons leaves a carbon to carbon pi bond here, and another pi bond at this position and this position. And now we just have our hydroxyl group at this position. And remember, we have kicked off the chloride ion, which means that we also have our chloride ion, which was a leaving group. And this is another example of the loss of a leaving group where the electrons, which were previously contained in a covalent bond, are being placed entirely on the leaving group, leaving behind a negative charged ion. The third pattern for arrow pushing mechanisms is going to be what is known as proton transfers, and these are very common in organic chemistry. In a proton transfer, we typically have some source like an acid or an alcohol or anything that contains protons that can be abstracted to be transferred between one molecule to another. In this example, we have a partially negative oxygen in this carbonyl compound, and an acid, H3O+, and what can happen here is the electrons can flow from this lone pair on oxygen and come and abstract the proton at this position. When this happens, the electrons are flowing from oxygen 
two hydrogen, which is why we draw the tail and the head of the arrow in this fashion. Now importantly, there were two electrons contained in the covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen from our acid, so we need to indicate that those electrons are moving to be exclusively on the oxygen atom from the acid. And this is gonna produce a protonated carbonyl compound and leave behind water as H2O, because when we've abstracted the proton from H3O+, we're now left with H2O. And importantly, this oxygen atom now now has two lone pairs of electrons. Now importantly, this was in the forward direction producing the protonated carbonyl compound. And what is important to notice is that another proton transfer could occur where that proton is transferred back to water to reproduce our initial acid. So in that example, remember the tail of our electron pushing arrow is going to begin at the lone pair and is going to come to a head at the location of the electrophile. In this case, that is gonna be this proton. And then these electrons are gonna be transferred back to this oxygen. And this is going to reproduce what we started with, which was our carbonyl compound and H3O plus. The fourth and final pattern is what is known as rearrangements. In order to understand rearrangements, we need to think about the orbital interactions that are occurring anytime we have a carbocation. In a carbocation, there's an empty p orbital which doesn't have any electrons in it, which is the reason that it is positively charged because there's a deficiency of electrons at that carbon position. And these can occur regularly when they are adjacent to electron donating groups. An example of this would be another alkyl group like a methyl group. Remember that methyl is the same thing as CH3. So at this position, there would be a CH3. And I've gone ahead and drawn the orbital interactions that are occurring for this stabilization to occur. So remember, this carbon has three CHs, and I've left this one as hydrogen to indicate that, remember, hydrogen is using an S orbital to interact with the P orbital on this carbon to make that sigma bond, which we often draw as just a straight line. Notice that when we look at the orbitals of this carbon, which has three hydrogens attached to it and is also attached to this carbon, giving it a valency of four, meaning that it is neutral. It is adjacent to that carbocation, which we drew here. And importantly, the lobes of these orbitals are going in the same direction with the same phasing. In other words, the same shaded colors. This means that these can actually interact in such a way that this causes the carbocation to be stabilized. Because in truth, there's some amount of electrons that can be shared with this adjacent carbocation in order to stabilize this carbocation. And if that's true, that some of these electrons, these two electrons that are in this carbon to hydrogen bond are being shared, then what can actually happen is that instead of being located at this position, those electrons can fully transfer over to that carbocation position which is going to cause the hydrogen to also shift over. This is what's known as a hydrogen rearrangement. And importantly, this type of stabilization that's occurring between these two orbitals that are causing for the stability of this carbocation to be increased is what is known as hyperconjugation. And this is a very high level uh, understanding for organic chemistry because this is one of those situations where understanding the actual orbital overlap between these two positions is going to give rise to a stability that not understanding the way that the orbitals are interacting may preclude you from understanding. Now, as we just talked about with hyperconjugation, if there are adjacent methyl groups which can donate electron density to that carbocation position, we can see that we increase the stability as we increase the number of adjacent methyl groups or ethyl groups or R groups as they're indicated here. So an R group just means an alkyl chain, meaning carbon and hydrogen bonds. So this would be an alkyl chain. So an R group is any alkyl chain. So in this case, we have a methyl group which doesn't have any alkyl chains which can donate electron density to stabilize this carbocation. Therefore, this is the least stable carbocation. Now, when we add alkyl chains because of hyperconjugation, we're actually increasing the stability of the carbocation position. So for that reason, primary is more stable than a methyl group. Similarly, secondary carbocations, which have two of those R groups, can now donate electron density to that carbocation to make it more stable. And similarly, for a tertiary carbocation, which has a carbon attached to three different alkyl chains, this is going to produce the most stable carbocation. Later in chemistry, you're going to encounter examples of molecules that can rearrange 
in order to increase the stability of different carbocations. So remember at this position, there is a carbon hydrogen atom. And importantly, because what can happen here is what's called a hydride shift, where remember those electrons and subsequently the carbon hydrogen bond shift over, this leaves behind a tertiary carbocation instead of being at position here where it's only a secondary carbocation. So notice there are two R groups here, one and two, making this a secondary carbocation. Whereas once this hydride shift occurs to make this new carbon hydrogen bond, what we're left with is one, two, three alkyl chains at this carbocation position, meaning that this one is now going to be a tertiary carbocation and thus more stable, which is the driving force for this hydride shift where the carbon hydrogen bond at this position can actually break and move over to create a more stable carbocation. All ionic mechanisms are just a combination of one of those four different patterns that we just covered. Let's consider an example which contains all four of those different mechanisms and electron pushing arrows. In this example, we have an alcohol which can deprotonate or do a proton transfer with hydrobromic acid. So the electrons will travel from the oxygen lone pair to the proton on hydrobromic acid. And remember, this is going to cause the electrons to shift over to the bromine, creating a bromide ion. And remember, this is what's known as a proton transfer. So this is a proton transfer because we are transferring a proton from one molecule to another. The product of this reaction now produces a positively charged oxygen atom which contains two different hydrogens and is going to now be positively charged. And the counter ion for this, remember we produced bromide as a result which because it has eight electrons or four lone pairs of electrons is now negatively charged. Now importantly what we've done here is we've created a good leaving group. So the next step can actually be the loss of a leaving group where the electrons at this position are going to move to be exclusively on the oxygen atom. And this is going to kick off a water molecule. Notice that it's H2O and it'll be neutral. So our loss of the leaving group is going to produce water and also going to leave behind a new vacancy of electrons at this carbon position, which we call a carbocation. So this is now a carbocation at this position. Notice, though, that this carbocation is attached to two alkyl groups, making it a secondary carbocation. We can produce a more stable carbocation by undergoing what's called a methyl shift. These are methyl groups here, and what can happen is these electrons can shift over to this position, moving the methyl group from one to another. And remember, anytime this happens, it is called a rearrangement because you're actually having a shift of part of the molecule. So this is a rearrangement, and what it is going to produce is now a new, more stable tertiary carbocation. So our new methyl group is now here, where this carbocation was previously, and we're still left with a two methyl groups here, but now we have an electron vacancy at this position. And notice that now this has one, two, three alkyl chains attached to it, so it is a tertiary carbocation and it's more stable. What we've generated here is a very strong electrophile. And remember that in this very first proton transfer step, we created bromide. This bromide ion is now a nucleophile and it's negatively charged. So the next step that occurs is nucleophilic attack, which we've also covered here, where the electrons at the bromine lone pair are going to move into position to attack this carbocation position. And remember, that was called nucleophilic attack. So nucleophilic attack occurs between an electrophile, which was the carbocation, and a nucleophile, which was the bromide ion. And this is going to give us a new product, which ultimately now is a different type of alkyl bromide because we're creating a new bromine to carbon bond. And notice that even though we walk through multiple steps in this overall mechanism, which is the series of steps that we that we convert one molecule into another, remember that they all relied on those four different patterns for electron pushing, which we've covered in this video. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your understanding. You should pause the video, try these problems independently, and then resume the video to check my answers. The first step in this overall reaction is going to be nucleophilic attack where the nucleophile, which was a hydroxide ion, is going to attack this carbonyl compound, specifically at the electrophilic carbon position. 
Remember that the carbon position is partially positive because the oxygen is negative. And this is going to cause this nucleophile to attack this carbon electrophile. So again, that's called nucleophilic attack. So nucleophilic attack is the first step of this mechanism. This generates a new intermediate. And what happens next is the loss of a leaving group where the electrons at this oxygen are going to come down and kick off this alkoxide ion. And this was able to occur because when we did nucleophilic attack at this carbon position, in order to not generate a five bond to carbon, these electrons had to move up to oxygen. And once they come back down, they eliminate the alkoxide species, which is the loss of a leaving group. So the loss of a leaving group is the next step. The final step that occurs is going to be a proton transfer where the alkoxide species, which was produced during the loss of the leaving group, comes and deprotonates the alcohol, placing the electrons back on this oxygen. And this leaves behind a species which now is going to contain a negative charge at this oxygen because there are going to be three lone pairs at this oxygen species. And again, this step was called a proton transfer. So this was a proton transfer. And being able to identify the different mechanism patterns that exist in a reaction mechanism are going to allow you to number one, predict molecules that are going to be created through overall molecular transformations, or organic reactions, but also be able to draw the electron pushing arrows to indicate how you proceeded through each intermediate or each step through this reaction to get to your final product. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and comment down below if you have any questions related to organic chemistry or anything else. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss out on any more organic chemistry content. I'll see you in the next video.